Okay, so hello and welcome to the Middle East Forum Speaker Webinar Series and Podcast. I'm Stacey Roman and I will be moderating this discussion today. We're pleased to have Dr. Edward Lewis, published strategist and extensive U.S. government service, including presidential transition teams, consultant to the Departments of Defense and State, the Army, the Navy, and the White House, join us to discuss Focus on the Palestinians, not their leaders. Dr. Loop Loot Walk will speak for 15 minutes, sorry, uh, then answer some questions. As this is a pre recorded webinar, we will be unable to take live questions from the audience. And with that, I'll turn the discussion over to Dr. Edward Lutwak. Hello. So, um, ever since the conflict was sort of internationalized a long time ago, there have been attempts to communicate with Palestinian leaders. These Palestinian leaders changed somewhat over time, but what they had in common was that they had no legitimacy. That is to say, they were not actually elected by anybody. They did not represent uh, anybody other than some clique or other, and they uh, did not also have any responsibility for their citizens. Um, so I don't want to compare them to uh, to sort of eminent figures of Western democracy, but I'll compare them to Nasrallah. Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah in Lebanon, is uh, perhaps not a very nice person, but he has a constituency. He actually has a constituency consisting of the population, the Shia of Lebanon in general, but the, the bulk of whom live uh, between Israel and Beirut. And he has shown repeatedly that he's very concerned about the welfare of the Shia. Uh, they, he, uh, and therefore, in dealing with Israel, in peace and in war, he is acting as a national leader who doesn't want his population to be dehoused by you know, uh, destruction, uh, aerial destruction, and he doesn't want them to suffer. He wants to be an important figure. He wants to threaten, he wants to look formidable, but he's concerned about his population. Now, throughout these dialogues between Israelis and Palestinians, they're always dealing with people who were serving the cause of Palestine or th their own cause or a factional cause or Muslim cause, or whatever you want, but they were never serving the Palestinians. They were willing to do anything for Palestine, nothing for the Palestinians. So if you went and told them, look, fellows, if you put bombs on buses, that's a particular moment in history, um, then you know this will cause, uh, it be fewer people will be employed because people won't be comfortable having Palestinians working in their garden, if the, and things like that. They were completely different. Why? They do not represent the Palestinian population. They do not serve the Palestinians, they serve Palestine. And Palestine is a wonderful ideal. And of course, it requires all the territory of uh, the Roman province of Palestine and so on, um, which uh, is sort of rather funny, it's been embraced by these people uh, and so on, their identity um, and so on, and they, do not represent anybody who actually lives there. Therefore, if you go to them and you say, this will cause them suffering, they're completely indifferent to it. That means that it's impossible to negotiate with them. You cannot, no, no country can negotiate with the, lead, no leaders of a country can negotiate with the leaders of that other country if neither side represents the population on one side. It's not possible because it means there are no trade-offs. You cannot say this is good for them, that's bad for them, because they don't care. They care only about, and Arafat, of course, was the exemplar. When there were these prolonged attempts to negotiate with Arafat, it's very, it happened several times that when things were about to be settled, he went to North Korea. He went on a trip to North Korea. Uh, and now uh, North Koreans are uh, people, uh, the North Korean leaders, the Kim, you know, Kim dynasty have perhaps other concerns, but they're definitely not concerned about the welfare of the Palestinian population. Uh, and he goes to North Korea and amid, when the negotiation is about to is, get to the stage of administrative things, whether you do this or that, he goes to North Korea. 
Another time when they were about to agree to something very important, he flew to Cape Town, which is not uh, uh, on a non-state to visit in effect, to go and talk to the Cape Town uh, Muslim community, the mosque there, most of whom are Malay Muslims. They are not Arabs of any sort. They're, they're Cape Malays. Their Islam is strictly a matter of identity maintained against the blacks, in effect. And he goes there, and there is an inflamed thing about destroying Israel, conquering Jerusalem, and all that stuff by people who have never been there, never will go there, never, absolutely not interested, whose own background is entirely removed from the Middle East, let alone from Palestine. So this is the point. Since it's not possible to negotiate with Palestinians and all attempts are futile because their leaders do not, in fact, serve the constituency. They're not like Nasrallah. Nasrallah clearly is very concerned about the population there. That's why he has kept the peace since 2006. He has fulminated and talked, but he is concerned. He, they've built beautiful houses right there within sight of the Israeli border. And it, and these people don't want their houses destroyed. You know, they work hard to build them and so on. So given that fact, what can one do? The only thing one can do is to have policies that are not even labeled Palestinian policies, that need not even be labeled Arab policies, or that simply policies that increase economic welfare in the occupied territories. They are occupied territories, that's what the world calls them, and functionally they're occupied even if they are forever Jewish lands and should never ever be alienated from the Jewish people because this being the land of Israel and so on. Never mind. You have to have, my recommendation is don't waste time negotiating with people who do not represent the Palestinians and instead deal with the Palestinians not as a national group at all, but under different categories, such as taxi drivers, construction workers, students, fishermen, whatever, and have professional dealings with them in order to, in, with the hope that they will participate in Israel's economic development, that they will have their own stake in that development, which of course they do on a very large scale. And that's why uh, the Arabs within Israel, for example, have a lower participation in terrorist actions than you know university graduates in, in California, as far as one can tell. Uh, they were, so the idea is the Israeli Arabs are well-behaved, and they're well-behaved because they have a huge stake in the welfare of Israel. The welfare of Israel and their own are not divisible. So the idea is that beyond the borders uh, of the Israeli Arab population to deal with the other Arabs, the West Bank ones, of course, uh, as the Arabs are, are captive to Hezbollah, uh, to, to Hamas, they are prisoners of Hamas. Uh, they will never get an election, uh, obviously. Uh, they're just one more Arab state, which is ruled by a dictatorial group. Uh, don't be surprised, all the others are so. But in the West Bank, to have non-policies that are not national policies, they're not Palestinian policies, they are simply these distinct policies that enroll more and more inhabitants in economic activities in conjunction with Israel. That is to say, to work with Israeli companies, to work in programs, to and, and to have uh, training schemes or whatever it is, none of them labeled as national, none of them labeled as political, but whose effect is to give a stake to, to give people there a stake in the welfare of the totality that is the welfare of the state of Israel. Now, in fairness, uh, I remember very well that within days of the June 1967 occupation uh, of these territories, as soon as uh, there was um, uh, a official of the Ministry of Agriculture in Israel that started work going in the West Bank and helping people to improve their crops. This started right away. And there was no great political philosophy behind it. The fellow had been working on crop improvement in Israel. So he said, why did I go there and so on? And um, this is that early activity done by a, perhaps an individual, although he was a member of the Ministry of Agriculture, 
That is the model that should be followed. And to waste no time talking to these the leaders who do not represent the population and therefore who are not actually leaders. They are simply people who have been thrown up by events in one sort or another that may be considered leaders by the New York Times or, you know, or the North Korean Herald, but they're not actually leaders in the sense that Nasrallah is a leader, in the sense that George Washington was a leader or Nasrallah or Ben Gurion. These are all people whose primary concern is the welfare of their constituents. So that is all I'm saying. So not a, a sort of broad philosophy thing. We're talking about 77 different activities, private, public, mixed private and public, whose purpose is these have to be uh, what they used to say in the old language, rentability. They have to be, of course, uh, economically sustainable, but which are directed for that purpose of, in effect, allowing these people to share in the prosperity and therefore uh, give them a stake in peace rather than war. That's it. All right, thank you so much. So the first question is from Dexter Van Zyl asking, what role can outsiders play in promoting your insights in rank and file Palestinians? Is there a way to convey these insights to the inhabitants of the Gaza Strip in the West Bank in a manner? I, I don't think there's any need to convey any insights to them. They're not short of insights. What they're short of are economic opportunities, job opportunities, educational opportunities, uh, parties, you know, sort of all manner of economic, quasi-economics, educational activities that bring a benefit to them, okay? It could be sports activities or anything that brings a benefit to them. They are living in these territories and they get connected to some Israeli activity. Now, of course, as you know very well, there are plenty of people uh, who are already so enrolled. But my idea is simply that at the leadership level, the focus should be on those activities and not in the futile quest for agreement with people who in fact do not represent those populations. I mean, I repeat, Arafat throughout his career was dedicating everything to Palestine, nothing to the Palestinians. Therefore, he was not in fact at all interested in negotiating in the way that, you know, any other national leader. He was not a national leader. He was simply a fellow pursuing an ideal. So we do not need to make any announcements. What's needed is a generic understanding of this and a generic encouragement of this. Thank you. He follows up with, it sounds almost like you want a Peace Corps approach to the improving of the welfare of the average uh, Palestinians whose interests are being ignored by their elites. Is this correct? Yeah, I hope so. But Peace Corps suggests sending confused American uh, university students to mess up agriculture in the Bolivian plateau. And that's not what I mean. Not to have people, Peace Corps is all about going to places you know nothing about and then to do something that you think that is good. Now, this is a different matter. This is a generic encouragement to Israelis who are doing serious things in Israel to think about, uh, you know, why not include them some way, employ them, do them, transfer them. And that generic encouragement, of course, has to be backed up by administrative support so that these plans don't get entangled by uh, security controls, checks, and things of the sort. That's the all that needed is an understanding of what it should be done and how to do that. Yeah, and Dexter's final comment there is, as a former Peace Corps volunteer, I must affirm your assessment. All right, it's so moving on to oh, Daniel Pipes. Uh, he says, thank you, Edward, for the very insightful presentation. Can your plan take place against the will of the PA and Hamas? Yes, uh, Hamas, and not, not with Hamas, no, because they they are just one more dictatorship. And unlike most Middle East dictatorships, they have a very small territory so they can really control it. And if the, anybody cooperates with any such schemes, they'll put a sack, you know, one of these sacks on his head and shoot him. But, so, but uh, definitely the West Bank. Definitely the West Bank. West Bank is wide open. West Bank, definitely there. 
and without any talk with the leaders. The leaders, uh, the leaders may, there's absolutely uh, no gain in talking with any leaders at all. And uh, if, if they come back and report that there have been sinister goings on, like, uh, you know, forms of employment or something like that, then they say, you know, people have to make a living. But no, I would not talk to the leaders because they're not leaders. They are, they, you know, the employees of the Palestinian Authority, which, if anything, pursues the Arab dream of Palestine, not the Palestinians. They're scarcely an effect, effective, efficient, or honest government. Thank you. On that note, uh, Benjamin Barrett asks, in a series of public opinion polls between 2015 and 2018 from the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, all survey respondents uh, ranked making enough income come to live comfortably as their top priority over the establishment of a Palestinian state. How do Hamas and the PA interfere with international efforts to bring investment and development to Palestinian communities? Well, um, yeah, I'm shocked to find out that the, that the people there uh, think that the most important thing is their income, uh, which perhaps is something only shared by 99.7% of humanity or 99.9% .9 of humanity definitely cannot be shared by anybody who follows a figure like Arafat, or indeed a figure like the current president of the Palestinian Authority, uh, whose clearly, whose purposes are entirely different, obviously. So uh, um, this is a, that is exactly the reality that uh, I think should be focused on. That is, leadership, Israeli leadership must understand that activities conducted with Palestinian leaders are pro forma. They should perhaps be con conducted even enthusiastically if they gain diplomatic points uh, internationally with the US and so on. But the focus should be on dealing with individual Palestinians or Palestinian social categories or Palestinian professional categories, dentists or uh, apple growers or whatever it is. And, and simply allocate the energy, the focus on those dealing with many disparate groups and not to simply stop wasting time with this thing. I mean, if the, you know, the annals of Camp David <laughs> are, you know, sort of a kind of parody of diplomacy, there being no substance to it. There never was substance from day one from it because in fact, the people were not representing the respective thing. The Israeli prime minister was representing Israel and the counterpart definitely was not representing the Palestinian people. Thank you. So do you think that these policies that you're suggesting can overcome, uh, Winfield Myers points out, uh, is it possible to close or curtail the Palestinian summer camps for children that teach them to hate Jews, encourage perpetual jihad, and uh, glorify endless terrorism and violence against Israel? Can, well, can these uh, policies you know, overcome uh, there's been some success in in uh, putting pressure on UNRWA and so on, for, but again, I I don't I'm not even personally I don't care about that at all. Why don't I care about it? Because uh, if somebody hates Israel completely, but during his actual existence on this earth, what he does, he works, uh, looks after his family, tries to improve. His, you know, repair that room that really needs to be rebuilt and so on and so forth, that person is not going to make trouble. He won't create a security problem. So, and as for the summer camps, they are the kind of activities that the Palestinian Authority and people like them sponsor as a substitute for anything that would actually be of any help for the population. Um, you know, it's... Um, and I remember that after the 2006 war, uh, Hezbollah went out to the southern Lebanon and uh, they had received a big grant from Iran because in those days the Iranians were more generous than they are now. And they had uh, they were going house to house and people's roofs, roofs had been damaged by the bombing, various other things. They gave them money to rebuild, okay? Palestinian Authority has never shared this money it has grudgingly given salaries and minimum payments, but you know, it, okay. Therefore, ignore them, ignore their summer camps where they teach them to hate Jews. Let them hate Jews. Why not? So long as throughout the 
their lives, they simply nourish their hatred while coming and working and building things there, building things in Israel and doing constructive material things. He said, let them have their own uh, you know, mental paradise where they are triumphant heroes and they feed the whole Israeli armored division all by themselves, so long as what they actually do is constructive uh, for their own interests and therefore there. I mean, it, the paradigm, it, to put it in a simple way, when uh, uh, then the former president, whose name I forget, but his first name is Donald, this fellow decided to move the U.S. embassy from a city called Tel Aviv to the capital of Israel, which is normal for embassies. Then there was an intention in, in Ramallah to do the world's largest demonstration against it. And then it didn't happen at all. And I was in Ramallah on a visit and I asked, I said, how come you didn't do a demonstration for this? Well, we wanted to, we really wanted to, but there was no parking, just no parking. There was no parking. So we couldn't go because we couldn't park our cars. So that is what you want. You don't care what's in their heads, okay? What you care is that they don't have parking. That's why they come demonstrate. Okay, fair point. All right, uh, Winfield Meyer also asks, Israeli leaders are afraid to alienate or harshly criticize Palestinian Authority leaders. Uh, are there any insurgent Israeli politicians who are willing to criticize uh, PA leaders and expose their self-serving corruption to the Palestinian rank and file? And would this strategy work? So um, uh, the essence of my proposal is that there's absolutely no need to expose anybody at all. Um, if Palestinian leaders are corrupt, then uh, it simply means that they are Arab leaders because, you know, the King of Morocco, and so you want to build, he's a wonderful man and everything you, and else, but the fact is that if you want to do a hotel development in Casablanca, the uh, the court has to get his share, okay? And that's the best of all Arab governments, as far as I know. The others are worse. So it's no use. It's like going to Italy and lecture Italians and saying, you eat too much pasta, you know? The Italians will not stop eating pasta just because you feel that they should eat something else, okay? So I would not waste time lecturing the Palestinians on corruption or trying to expose the corruption. Um, telling Palestinian inhabitants of the West Bank that their leaders are corrupt, you know, is like pointing out that, you know, the sky is blue or something. Uh, well, it, one should be fortunate <laughs> these days. But um, in other words, it, the whole idea is that they should be treated with courtesy, politeness, and detachment, because they don't count. They can't do anything positive, and they can do not much negative, and therefore it's a waste of time talking to them. It's a waste of time lecturing them, and it's certainly a waste of time to subvert them by going to the Palestinians, and I'm sitting there, a Palestinian, and I need more work, and I did this and did, and I would, like, I would like to have a better bicycle, and some Israeli comes and tells me that my leader is corrupt. How does that help me? I need a good bicycle. You know, my bicycle is an old and broken one. I need a new one. So don't waste people's time by telling that their leaders are corrupt. If they know that perfectly <laughs> well. And by the way, they don't resent it because morally speaking, they know that if they were in that position, they would be just as corrupt, if not more. So if corruption works when you have severe sort of northern republics where the Swedish Minister of Health has to resign from a position her party and from parliament because she used the, her official card to take her kids to the lake, okay? When we get to that point, it'd be worthwhile talking about corruption. Thank you. From Dexter Van Zyl, does the influx of money from NGOs to uh, elites in Ramallah represent an obstacle to your strategy? This money seems to be purchasing increased conflict and not economic development. Yeah, uh, I mean, if you're feeding, if, if an NGO that deals with grape growers or, you know, uh, uh, sort of donkey raisers, whatever, uh, Conceivably, does not. Yeah, but most NGOs are from people, you know, who have studied at university, the, all those wonderfully useful things, you know, like, uh, I don't know, uh, the sociology of um, nightclub owners. They don't know anything. First of all, they know nothing. They know nothing. They go there, 
they want to do it, they want to engage with and so on, and they they transfer some money from time your American time wasters go to Ramallah to transfer money to Palestinian time wasters. And of course, everything they tell them is nonsense, and what they hear from them is nonsense, and uh, it's all irrelevant, and nothing can be done about it as far as I know. But since all of that, none, nothing can actually be done that doesn't have other costs, you know, image costs, but diplomatic costs. So I would ignore them as well. The idea is to bypass, bypass and deal directly with almost economic goods. That is to say the normal person, the normal person who wants to have a better bicycle or a better car, or he wants to, you know, um, possibly have a better school for his child and things like that, is to deal with them directly. You see, the Israeli government deals with the population of South Lebanon directly and giving them the choice of being bombed and not being bombed. And as it happens, they prefer not to be bombed. And because Nasrallah is a national leader who represents a population, who cares about them, the fact that they don't wish to be bombed flows into his policy and shapes his policy. In spite of all the requests he gets from the Iranians to earn his, his keep, you know, by having some conflict activity, he doesn't do it. That is the idea. The idea is to focus on that and ignore NGOs and the other Palestinian authorities. Let them talk, let them do whatever it is, because even if they, they, they try to corrupt the population and in effect, they stimulate conflict. It's like the visit from one of these Congress people, like uh, you know, Tlaib or something would come. She would try to inflame them, okay? Um, so that's irrelevant. If you have them participating in activities that preclude conflict, then you're done. Okay, let's do a, a go over the border in southern Lebanon, talk to these people living in those mansions they built with all the money they made. Uh, dealing diamonds in Sierra Leone and ask them what they think about Israel. Oh, I hate Israel. I hate Israel. I wish to see it destroyed. I said, good. Now, would you support his Hezbollah launching some rockets? No, no, no. For goodness sake, don't mention that. No rockets, no rockets. That kind of thing. And that's the reality. So, I mean, the, today, uh, because of the evil Hezbollah, all the people living on, on the, on the, on the, uh, Chris Safan, you know, along the border and all that stuff, uh, make money with Airbnb. Before the wicked Isbala, what the, uh, periodically some Palestinian would launch some futile Katusha over, and the area could not, uh, you know, uh, was not peaceful. That inhibited investment, inhibited activities. There were no Airbnbs and so on. So that is what you want. What you want is a de facto. Uh, a de facto tranquility, de facto peace, uh, done because of the, the the interest of the Palestinians, not as sort of the Palestinians, but as normal people, you know, a uh, father, husband, uh, plumber, etc. Okay, so to sum up here, uh, Ben Bard, Barrett asked, uh, so do they uh, do? Palestinians reject the two-state solution and prefer an outcome that includes regaining all historical Palestine from uh, river to sea. Uh, are they becoming less realistic about the Palestinian statehood? Or, as you're saying, essentially this doesn't matter as long as they're they're economically uh, sound. Right. It's like the, the, the failure, you know. Right. So the people who really want, who really want Palestine free from the river to the sea, or people studying at the University of Toronto who have actually never been there, no intention of going there, and uh, uh, who they, they, they can have this type of position. Uh, people who are living there have to be more concerned that in attempting to go from the river to the sea, they'll get killed, or their sons get killed, or their father gets killed. Uh, and so, so in that vein, again, focus on trying to to uh, uh, let's call it, at the minimum remove as many administrative obstacles as possible to the normal economic interaction between economic uh, entities of a different level. That is to say, labor is cheaper. So if there's cheaper labor next door to people where labor is more expensive, you should be able to have employment for them and things of that sort. I mean, um, you know, uh, my 
my nephew uh, in Israel, uh, who lives very close to an Arab village, uh, he goes there to buy fruits and vegetables. And that shopkeeper, if that shopkeeper is dreaming about having uh, all of Palestine from the river to the sea or not, the fact is that he, de he depends on people like my nephew buying fruits and vegetables for him. And therefore, I trust that he, is, he hasn't yet, uh, you know, rushed uh, to join, um, uh, you know, to, to become a Hamas operative and to, uh, you know, uh, start throwing bombs and so on, because he's selling uh, fruits and vegetables. And the idea is to spread that. Okay? This is how empires have always lived for centuries. It was not to persuade them that it was wonderful to be ruled by the British or something of the sort. It was simply the fact that people's everyday lives required them to cooperate with the power that be. The power that be in the West Bank is uh, the Israeli power that be, and you give them, in, in, do everything possible administratively to remove obstacles to such economic uh, integration, and if possible, encourage the economic integration. Uh, so I don't know how you encourage my nephew to buy more fruits and vegetables from that particular Arab village, which is so close to, he lives on a kibbutz, very close to it. He's a, one of his kibbutz that have gone completely capitalist, but still a kibbutz, and it's very close to the thing. And I don't know how you encourage my nephew to do it. He's already doing it. Uh, but conceivably, let's say there are checkpoints when if people come and do it, one has to trade off the purposes of checkpoints, which is to check things with ease of movement and so on. So ease of movement would be, uh, that is, uh, having a, 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 the, a sort of a politically advised ease of movement versus security trade-offs. That may be, uh, uh, you know, the kind of stuff. But even that's too conceptual. The main thing is a message to go out clearly so people to understand this is what we should be doing. You know, uh, it's, uh, the last time I was in Israel, I visited another relative and we went to Nablus because he had uh, something wrong with his transmission and he had the guy in Nablus who repaired it. Now, I actually did not demand to hear from this mechanic who knew how to, to repair this transmission, what his views were on politics, whether in Tasmania or somewhere in the Middle East. And I didn't ask him about, you know, Ukraine war. I simply, you know, I was curious to see where I said, I did ask him a question. I said, where do you learn to repair transmissions? And uh, he said that he'd worked for a Volvo, uh, a Volvo dealership uh, somewhere in Germany. So that's it. That's what we want to do. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. We've come to, come to the close of our webinar. Thank you again, Edward, for joining us today. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Of course. For our viewers, please join us for, please be on the lookout for our weekly webinar offerings email coming out over the weekend. Thank you all for joining I'm us. I'm grateful that you moved the time. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Of course. Bye. Bye.